Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought we would celebrate Green Living and Earth Day all at the same time as we bring back something that seems to have fallen off the horizon. During the 1930s through the 1970s, it was considered the golden age of photojournalism, especially when it came to producing nature on both film and television. On the program today, we'll be talking with someone who is known as the Pollinator Queen. She is known as someone who really loves and has an affinity for birds, bees, butterflies, and bats. Her book is The Hummingbird That Answered My Heart's Calling. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Noel M. Mead Izzy. Noel, how are you today? Hi, good. How are you, Daniel? Thank you for having me. doing well. You know, when you get to produce work like you have here, I'm sure that each day just gets a lighter step for you, doesn't it? (laughs) Wow, you know what? Nobody has actually um, said that, and that's exactly how I feel in my life ever since, you know, this, this wonderful experience is, and that's what I try to, to convey is there's something about when you suddenly get that aha connection with the beauty of the natural world around us, whether we live in the city or not, every day there's something to look for. There's something that enriches you just a little bit more by the simplicity and beauty of of nature and just going outside and appreciating it. You know, and it's so true, and your book just, you know, brings back not only a lot of memories, but also a realism of when we look around ourselves at today's world. Everybody, seemingly, has a handheld cell phone. Their faces are buried in this damn thing, and they don't wake up and take a look around at what's happening around them. And sometimes it's just such an aggravating scene to see that we're becoming that disconnected because of technology. Yeah, I actually, you know, I, um, I'm i very um, in tuned and have studied for a long time the, the meridians, the chakra systems in the body. And um, the seventh chakra is the crown chakra. And um, I call us the crown down society because, you know, our, our crown chakra is supposed to be our connection, our direct link from the top of our head to the divine, which is, you know, out there in the ethers, the supreme intelligence, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it. And it's interesting because we're not walking in an upright position anymore. We're walking with our, our crowns facing down. And it's, not, it's no coincidence that we're not connecting with the divine. And by the way, the divine is the natural world around us, you know, the earth, the the soul of the earth. So, yeah, it's really kind of sad. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago I was talking with anthropologist Wade Davis, and he was, uh, in one of his books he was talking about, as I read this, it was really fascinating because you just could see the explosiveness where there is a particular uh, indigenous culture where when it is decided that the birth of the new medicine man, the shaman for the particular group, uh, is to be that this baby is actually born in a dark cave. And for the first year, it spends its time with its mother, but eventually is weaned away from the mother. And then eventually people within the group, uh, specialists, if you will, they go in and this this baby ends up growing up its first like eight or nine years within this cave. And it's told of all of these marvelous wonders of the world. So here's this child growing up with this tremendously rich imagination. And the explosive part begins when they finally give it its rite of passage to come out of the cave and now begin to see and experience all these wonders it was told about over these years. And you could just feel nature explode. And I'm sure you had a lot of those kind of experiences out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if if we just take the time to um, observe what's going on around us. And, you know, it's funny because there's so much out there, you know, especially when you see spring and summer emerging. You know, wintertime is kind of that, that time where we're supposed to sort of go within, we're, we're in sort of a hibernation. Our, our bodies are the time, you know, on, on Earth, the way the sun rises and sets. So, you know, during the winter, it's okay to kind of 
go within, but as soon as spring and summer emerge, you know, outside of just being, you know, going and getting a tan or, or whatever, there's so much happening. There's so much sound and um, so many different types of birds that are out. You, one of my greatest things is just observing bees. I mean, just, you know, on a walk when you see them foraging and then you realize, you know, what exactly they're doing. And the fact that the, the bees that are actually out foraging that you see in flowers are the most experienced in the hive. They've actually lived at least 21 days. Mm-hmm. So because every bee has its role in the hive, they don't all just become bees from the larva and then take off and, and forage. They all have to do something within the hive before they're promoted to foraging. So it's just really wonderful to watch all of the different elements in nature, the flowers, the, the buds of the leaves of a, you know, a new generation of, of tree, you know, leaves coming out. And it's really quite beautiful and enriching and simple. I mean, life is so complicated these days. Mm-hmm. You know, Noel, that's so true. And you say something that I so impassionately love to watch myself. There's nothing greater than you have one of those sort of warm, almost lazy feeling days of the sun coming out and it's just nice. And you're sitting there and there it is, the bees, bumblebees, regular honeybees, whatever it is, and they just have such a cuddly way when they're on the flowers. It's sort of like the flower and the bee are not only dancing, but they're making love to each other all at the same (laughs) time. And you could. You could literally sit there. I know I could for hours just watching something like that. Absolutely. And you know what's so funny is, you know, I don't, I'm sure your audience, when we're talking about this, because they're in alignment with, with your show and your message, they're probably going, yeah, you know. And, but maybe someone who doesn't quite, they're not there where we are, might be going, these people are crazy. But let me tell you, the other day I was walking and I watched this one honeybee. She must have been... Um, taking a bath or she must have gotten wet somehow on her foraging. And so I watched her and she had all six of her little legs holding on to the very perimeter of a leaf while she fanned her wings. And her wings were moving so fast as if she was flying, but because she knew that if she didn't hold on tight to the leaf, she would take off and it looked like she wanted to dry her wings. So she's fanning her wings and they're moving really fast, very, very blurred vibration while she's holding tight to the leaf so she doesn't lift off. And what was interesting is this helicopter flew overhead you know, where I was walking and the sound of the helicopter, the, the um, blade of the helicopter was in perfect unison with the way her, um, her wings, and it, it was like almost like her wings were creating the helicopter sound and vice versa. And I was hysterical. I mean, I actually started laughing out loud at how almost ridiculous it could sound if I told this story and that I was conjuring this in my head. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things when you, if you look in close enough and pay enough attention, just the fact that she was holding on for dear life so she wouldn't take off so she could fan her wings was just, it was just, adorable and hilarious all at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's where the imagination of a cartoonist comes in. (laughs) Because you've had that experience, you can actually do that within the cartoon, and people go, well, I would have never thought about that, but that's kind of interesting. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's where my, the whole thing, because, you know, beyond this book, I'm I'm in this process of completing a series of children's books. Mm -hmm. And that imagination has always been with me since a kid, you know, so... Yeah, it's it's fun, you know, to conjure up those those kind of dialogues when you see something happen. But those are the things that happen that you can just get such a kick out of. You know, whether it's true or not, you're kind of making it up, and it's really great. How did you come to receive the title of the Pollinator Queen? Um, you know, it was something I was working with um, a, a marketing team, and um, we were just talking about where my passion is. And obviously from the experience with the hummingbird, which is one of our primary pollinators, and then I was talking about my work with the bees and, you know, the research and the education that I'm putting out there and also, you know, my next projects and so on. And then I was talking about the bats and, 
and the butterflies. And, you know, when I was talking about the bats, you know, a lot of people don't understand that the bat is actually one of the four major pollinators in the world, you know, on our planet. And a lot, you know, I was telling them this and they're like, how do you, how would, would anybody even know that? And so we were kind of <laughs> laughing, you know, because I was telling them, well, here's how the bat actually pollinates. They don't have like a long beak, but they have this thing that rolls up under their rib cage, kind of like a proboscis, but it's not. And, and they're like, you're like a pollinator queen, aren't you? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I don't know. I just know that I have a, a special affinity with, you know, the benevolent creatures that constantly give and give and give you know, and that's what our pollinators do. I just mm. have such a, a reverence for them because of their contribution, and I want to sustain them, and I want to be a part of making sure that we're faithful stewards to them. Mm. So I think that's how it kind of came up. It was just sort of a, a natural kind of flow in a conversation, so it kind of stuck. You know, bats, too, seem to be one of those that for whatever strange reason as humans we've decided to allocate to the evil side of things, you know, a lot like spiders. But the truth is, bats are nothing like a lot of people think they are, are they? Oh, absolutely not. You know, that's the thing about storytelling. And I, I, I'm not here to judge, you know, mm-hmm. well, the entertainment industry does this. Or, but it, what, what happens is, is when you have an, a whole industry that is talking about the natural world around us, whatever it is. So we'll take bats for an example. And they have these really exciting stories of lore about the vampires and sucking your blood and killing you and, you know, that kind of thing. Children, they like that because it's exciting and entertainment, entertaining. But then it's our job as just the average parent, teacher, friend, uncle, aunt, educator to inform these kids of the real story. That's fantasy. The real story of bats is X, Y, and Z. Because the problem is, is those children grow up to believe in the lore and they don't understand the reality and then they become fearful. And that's the thing is the, the combination of fear and habitat destruction when it comes to our bats is a lethal combination. You've got people that because of their misguided fear, they go into a bat cave and light it on fire and kill thousands of roosting bats. What they don't understand is every time you take a bite of a banana or you have a, a mango or a succulent peach during the summertime or the, the adult that enjoys their wonderful strawberry Cadillac or mango margarita, that <laughs> margarita comes from the pollination of the agave nectar or the agave plant that is then turned into tequila. Mm-hmm. So these, you know, bats are believed to, to pollinate over 500 di- different types of tropical plants. And um, they fly huge distances, you know, and they drop seeds as they go along and and pollinate these plants. And so it's it's just a matter of education and dispelling fear mm-hmm. because they're very, in part, they're very important in our ecological system and our food supply. Mm-hmm. You know, it's fascinating with bats. Uh, I've had encounters with bats over the years. And they've always been fascinating. And one of the most unique ones was a friend of mine who had a house uh, in Northern California, and it was one that he was working on. I mean, this was a tremendously large house something like 12,000 square feet. And it was an area that we stayed in, and it was really just kind of like the floor. uh, Basically, it was gutted out, and it was being rebuilt on the inside, so we just decided to spend the night there in this area. And he has sort of a dome in an area, so it's kind of difficult to describe. So I slept on an air mattress up there, and I had the light on, and it was kind of a dim light off in the distance. And uh, the next thing you know, a bat comes flying in then another one, and then another one, and there must have been five or six bats that flew in. One of the most amazing experiences is I felt like I was sitting in the shadows with enough light to see them, but as they flew, they would come toward me, and literally there were moments that I could literally look right at their faces. That's how close they would get. But they never touched me, and that was what was really fascinating. And so for a good hour this was going on, they'd fly, and they'd come by, and you could see their face, literally their eyes, you know, in this place that I was staying at. 
I thought, what a neat experience. It's, it's kind of like they're checking you out, but they know better, you know, <laughs> and they yeah. go about their business. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's just like bees, you know, it, like you're talking about. They, they, you know, inherently they're not out there. They're not thinking, I, you know, I want to harm something. They're just doing their thing, just like bees. And, mm-hmm. you know, bees get a bad rap. People have the assumption that, you know, they've got to swat bees. The bees are... They think about stinging people. They want to sting people. And by the way, bees are a very, very harmonious creature and very gentle in nature. And the only time that they will ever attack is when they feel threatened. And there's actually times of the season where they feel more more threatened. And because they're such guardians of their hive, when their hive has a high level, like in high season, summertime and spring, when their hive has a high hives have a high level of larva, that is when they're at their greatest um, guard state where anything that threatens the hive and the future of the hive via the, the larva, they're much more aggressive. But during the time when, when bees, what's called swarm, they'll, they'll, there's an initial hive. And then when the season gets really high, the queen will create a swarm whereby she wants to move a section of the hive to a new location. And during that swarm, all of the worker bees and scout bees are more focused on finding that new and exciting home. So they're really, really vulnerable and non-aggressive mm-hmm. So because there's no larva yet. So, you know, they have their cycles, but they're not out to get people. When you see one flying around, to swat it is, is futile because their intention isn't to sting anything as long as you leave it alone, it will leave you alone. And the same with, with the bats, you know? Well, They're my understanding, too, uh, Noelle, is that the bee, uh, and this is different from a wasp or a yellow jacket, is the fact that when it stings, it only gets one shot, and, and then it's done because it actually tears a part of its body. Is that true? Yes, because okay. their stinger is barbed. Mm-hmm. So when it goes into the skin, it, it doesn't come back out. It's not a smooth... Um, stinger. So the stinger, like you said, you know, it literally tears their body apart. And so that that's another thing that, you know, I kind of just in a, the most gentle way, because I don't want to talk about suicide here, but, you know, when a bee stings you, you have to understand that your fear of that bee is, is just that, a fear. That bee is willing to, to die to protect itself and the brood, the, the, what it loves, what it lives for. So when it stings you, it doesn't get another shot. It dies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's another thought to, to you know, just kind of ponder like these 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 bees are willing to die for, for their cause and for the love of their cause. And so um, it's not intentional. So one of my biggest things is just trying to dispel the fear and, and instill, especially into children, that when you want to like, kill a bee that's out in your backyard during your swimming party, you know, or your birthday swim party, and your mom has set out watermelon and strawberries and blueberries and this beautiful fruit, you know, layout, every time you take a bite of that free fruit, that little bee that you want to swat and kill because you're afraid of it, produced that for you. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have that without that little bee. So that's really important to me to... to teach children because eventually they're going to be making the really important decisions, you know, in the next generation. I have a friend who actually has a farm up in Washington and sort of like one of them community agricultural type farms where people who, you know, are learning about agriculture and they're learning about farming, they can actually go and they stay here and they trade work, uh, to stay on this farm for as long as they, you know, need to. And most of the time it's students who are trying to learn about this particular uh, thing of farming. And uh, one of the things that uh, she's pretty knowledgeable about are bees. And she mm-hmm. was saying that roughly about 80%, and, you know, I don't know how true this is, but maybe she's just talking about honeybees, is that 80% of them can't sting, you know, that they're actually out to go and gather. And, and that's it, that the ones that are, the stingers are, tend to be the ones that are close to the nest or the hive, if you will. Well, they, the, the, she may be right. I mean, if she knows 
if that's something she knows is if she's a beekeeper. Mm-hmm. I do know that the when bees are actually born, when they evolve out of the larva state, there are many different um, roles that um, bees have in the hive. And because the hive can, I mean, depending on the season, high season you have 60 to 80,000 bees in the summertime hives. In the wintertime, it's like 20 to 40,000. So uh, queen bees don't have a stinger. And the drones, the males, don't have a stinger. Now, the larva that turns into the actual worker bee, um, before they're able to um, be promoted, if you will, to the forager and to a scout, which actually goes out into the fields, collects nectar and pollen and brings it back to the hive, they have to be what's called a construction worker. So they have to be able to build the hive. They have to be um, like a royal servant, if you will. So they work directly with the queen and they feed her the royal jelly and they make sure that she's growing at the rate she's supposed to. They have the guards within the hive that have that are used specifically as guards around the hive and they do use their stingers and because the queen and the drones don't have stingers, that is their specific role is to to guard with their stinger and die in the process if they have to. Um, So these bees, they have um, the maintainers of the hive. They have the nurse, nurses of the hive. I mean, these bees are so incredible in their integration and their cooperation and their harmonious way of working within the hive. Every single bee knows its role, how long the role has to they have to maintain that role, and they don't deviate from it. And after 21 days, the bees then are um, transitioned into being foragers while the ones behind them, because the larva is constantly being turned into bees. You know, queen is making 2,000 new larvae a day. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's absolutely fascinating. So it wouldn't surprise me now. I don't know for sure if they don't have stingers, I just know that they probably don't use them mm-hmm. out in the field. But, you know, you I've been stung by a bee when I was riding my bicycle and it was a forager. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't where I was near their hive and they stung me. So that bee actually had a stinger. However, it probably isn't its job to use that stinger because there's no threat out in the open, you know, while they're out scouting and foraging. But closer to the hive, they probably use their stingers a lot more. Now, what's alarming, too, is to realize that bees are on the decline. And tell us from your experience why. I mean, obviously, pollination is a big deal. But we're even seeing to the point where you have sort of like an industry around bringing bees from, you know, uh, orchard to orchard or whatever the case may be. But that's a very unnatural way for things to happen because as bees collect and harvest and pollinate, you know, they're dealing with individual ecosystems. And, you know, to be able to unnaturally move them from, say, point A to point B, you're kind of like, it's almost sort of like going out and finding the active ingredient in a plant, then creating a drug that's going to have a terrible side effect over time. I absolutely agree with you. And really, it's heartbreaking because it's not natural, but we've gotten to a point where colony collapse disorder or, you know, what was labeled back in 2006 when, you know, Europe started, the UK started recognizing this decline of bees. It was called the vanishing bee syndrome. And colony collapse disorder is strong, going strong right now. Um, I think last year the commercial beekeepers reported between 40 to 100% losses of their colony size. And that was just in 2013. So it's one of those things where, People think, well, I heard about something like that, but it's been a while. Is it still going on? Absolutely, it's still going on. And it's claiming North America and Europe's bees. Now, there are other countries that, because we do know there have been many, many theories about what's causing the decline of these bees. And they call them vanishing bees because what happens is is the foragers leave the hive um, to to go and, you know, get the pollen and, and the nectar, whatever, to feed the hive, and they just don't return. So they're dying off out in the field. Meanwhile, 
All of the other bees that rely on them, the queens, the larva, the drone, back at the hive, die off as well because they don't leave the hive to go forage. Their food supply comes directly from the foragers. So it's really, I mean, outside of the logistics of it, it's such a sad thing to think about because these bees are so beholden to one another. Mm -hmm. They're so integrated and, and that's what they live for is their colony. And to have humans have a hand in this, and we do know now that there are certain pesticides that are being used, mass pesticides in mass agriculture, as well as commercial um, gardening. You know, we go to the big box stores and we pick up a, a canister of Roundup, which mm. is, you know, killing the, the monarchs because Roundup destroys milkweed, which is the food source for monarch butterflies. You know, you go and you pick up a bear product, the bear garden and rose treatment or whatever, and you don't realize... These are the specific pesticides called neonicotinoids that are destroying the bees and all of the pollinators because they're systemic. So they, they get into the root of the plant, go up through the branches of the plant, into the flower of the plant, and then contaminate the nectar and the pollen. And so there were studies where scientists would go back to these, these hives that would die off and they would study the hives to see what was there that had caused this and these neonicotinoids were all over the place. Mm -hmm. The fungicides and the pesticides were just rampant in the hive. And so they do know that this is causing uh, the decline of the bees. So there are countries that have banned the use of these pesticides. There are states here in the United States, I believe Oregon is one of them, that are banning the use of these pesticides. The problem is, is the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA here in the United States, they aren't even willing to study this full effort until 2018. Mm. And by the twi time 2018 rolls around, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what weird company is going to be manufacturing a robot hive you know, and it's just, it's disrespectful to the bees and we just have to have, you know, the consumer has to be a smart um, purchaser. They, when they go and they cultivate their gardens in the spring and summertime, they need to go to the right places and ask the right questions and as a result purchase the products that aren't going to be detrimental to the health of these bees. So, you know, colony collapse disorder is up and running, and our, our bees are dying at alarming rates still. Now, I know that most of our listeners are probably scratching their heads, wow, this is a great discussion on bees and bats, but I thought you started off talking about a book about hummingbirds. So <laughs> why don't we talk about the ultimate pollinator, at least from your experience, Artemis? Artemis. Well, um, this, this experience, um, which kind of led me to really look into to pollinators was more of just a, a personal journey. During the market crash of 2008, um, I had just started my own company, so I left the corporate world and the security of the corporate environment to become an entrepreneur as a graphic designer and start my own boutique design firm doing marketing and advertising. And I had purchased my own home a couple years prior. I was newly single, but everything seemed fine. I had the, the world in the palm of my hand, or, you know, or so I thought. And um, then the market crash hit, and I started to become very, very fearful. And the interesting part of this story is that, and what I like to tell people is that, I didn't actually experience firsthand the effects of the crash. So I didn't lose my home. I did have to budget myself a little better because my clients were kind of holding off on, on spending marketing and advertising dollars. But I still had a, a way to sustain myself and pay my bills. I didn't have to move back in with my parents. But the what ifs, I mean, that's the thing about our mind. It's so powerful. The what if I lose my clients? What if I can't pay my mortgage? What if I have to move back in with my parents? What if I fail? And the what ifs started to inundate my days and my nights. And I started to experience 
horrible panic attacks. And a panic attack, the first time you experience something like this, it, the symptoms are like a heart attack. Now, at the time, I didn't know that I was having a panic attack. Panic attack. I thought I was having a cardiac arrest. Mm. So, of course, I went to the ER, and they did all my vitals, and they said, you know, your heart's fine. I went to a cardiologist after that just to make sure. But the doctor did tell me what you were experiencing was a full-fledged panic attack. And, um, and these are the symptoms, and yes, it's pretty scary. And yes, there are anti-anxiety um, drugs that we can prescribe if that's you know, the, the route you want to go. But at the time, I, I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to figure out um, there was some internal healing I needed. I wanted to figure out why, what was so powerful that I was experiencing these, these attacks that I have never, ever in my life had before. And so I remember just starting to pray. I would go out for walks every single morning and I would just pray, you know, to, to the natural world around me, to God, to the, 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 the sky and the sun and at night the moon and the stars. Whatever was just I felt close to and connected to, I would just speak, you know, please help me and I'm willing to learn the lesson here. I am open and receptive to the guidance of healing. And the answer to, to that prayer was this hummingbird that, you know, a couple weeks into my prayer regimen, this little bird decided to nest on my balcony and she was truly the answer to my heart's calling, which is the name of the book. Mm-hmm. And um, the most profound life learning lesson that I have had in my life to this day because it changed me completely. It changed my perspective um, about myself, about the natural world around me, about about our own. Um, we become very self-absorbed and self-involved, uh, like the, the universe revolves around us. And that's where the imbalance comes in. Mm-hmm. And so when adversity kind of hits, you, you're completely thrown off balance and into the, you know, feeling like you're just tumbling through the ether. And guess what? Nature never experiences that. I thought Artemis was a fascinating name for this bird. How did you come to name that bird that name? Um, I thought it was pretty um, interesting, too, because <laughs> I had never heard about... Okay, so I had this um, deck of goddess cards that... Um, you know, I always loved studying the different um, gods and goddesses of different cultures and what their symbolism was and, you know, what their meaning was and how they interacted. And the son of Zeus was the da- uh, the, the brother of so-and-so. So, you know, the goddesses I was always interested in, too, because of the feminine energy. And so I had this deck of cards. And one afternoon I was uh, sitting on my bed and I could see Artemis in her nest. And it was probably about three and a half weeks into our relationship, if you will. And I thought to myself, you know, I, um, I should probably name her because, you know, I feel like I'm forging this, this relationship with her and I don't have a name. I just keep calling her Little Bird. So I remember getting my cards out because I thought, well, what, what I do know is she's a goddess. This is the, the epitome of the most beautiful feminine energy I've ever seen. And she's so petite and, and just lovely. And so I got the cards and I shuffled them and I looked at her and I said, what's your name, little bird? Who, who are you? You tell me. And so I'm shuffling away and I pull out Artemis. And it's funny because my, my expectation, my mind, my ego wanted to call her you know, Athena or Diana, you know, one of the, the foo-foo, beautiful goddesses that everybody talked about. I had never even heard of Artemis, mm-hmm. but that's the card that I pulled. And the photo on the front of the card was of kind of like a tomboy goddess. She um, had short brown hair, and she was standing on this bluff out in nature, and she had all these animals at her feet kind of like a St. Francis of Assisi, the way the animals sort of surrounded her. And Artemis was the goddess guardian of nature. 
And she had this bow and arrow in the photograph, and I remember reading about it, and it said Artemis doesn't use her bow and arrow to injure anything. What she uses it for is to stay hyper-focused on her goal and her role on Earth as the guardian of the natural world around her. Wow. I know. And I was like, wow, okay. And so I said, okay, Artemis it is. I mean, it's not one that I ever expected, but that's who you wanted me to see the energy of. And I tell you, as the weeks and the months went by and I watched this mother hummingbird build her nest, you know, uh, have her, you know, have the egg, incubate the egg, continue as the baby was born to raise her baby, protect her baby, feed her baby, continue the construction of the nest, making sure that every time the baby changed in his feathers, the color of his feathers, she would add new elements to the nest that camouflaged his growing body. And I thought, talk about guardian of nature. Talk about fiercely independent. That's exactly what this bird was. So the name was completely appropriate. And when I asked who you are, that's who she told me she was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a, a really an interesting thing that you say in your book, and this comes from Chapter 7. And just, by the way, for the audience out there, uh, in this book that we're talking about here, The Hummingbird That Answer My Heart's Call, beautiful photographs in here that go along with the passages that you write about in the story as well. And uh, the one that really stepped out, because it was a lot of like what you were talking about in 2008, that uncertainty that we can feel uh, where there's those what-ifs, especially when things aren't going well. And this was when you were about to take a trip to Paris. And uh, and I'll just read what you say uh, here in the book, and that is uh, that you were wondering, for instance, when the baby bird would finally break its way into the world, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that I was about to be about to miss the special moment I had been anticipating for quite some time. I explained to her that I would be gone for a little while and that I would miss her very much. Quote, will you miss me? I asked. Would she even notice my absence? I knew it was silly to think so, but there was a silly something between us, and again, all in good fun. Now, why I found that fascinating to read is just, um, uh, is that I think that's where we get that feeling that we're alone in this world, and it seems to be one of those burdens that we have as a human species, that when we step off the merry-go-round as though nature won't miss us, <laughs> you know, and it almost mm-hmm. seems to be a folly for us to be co-participants in it. But that's kind of that big question that you have to answer to say, you're really never alone, and you're never really you know, that you are missed. Yeah, I mean, I that's one of the one of the greatest lessons is that as soon as you authentically open yourself up to nature, and when I say authentically, I really mean that. That's a very mm-hmm. important because Mother Earth and all of her natural beings, including humans, we know when we meet someone and we're communicating with them, we know if someone is being authentic and sincere. And so does nature, and so does Mother Earth. So when I say, when you get to a point in your life when you have decided, I want a relationship with the natural world around me, And as I walk out, I say, Mother Earth, speak to me in a language I can understand. And you say that with the truest, deepest sincerity of the heart. It will respond. Nature will respond, and it will be there with you, and it will show you that you matter, and you won't feel alone, and it will miss you. And that's the thing is when it got to the point that I was leaving for Paris, we we had cultivated a relationship that she knew there was no way this bird, because everything is energy. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just this woo-woo um, concept of energy and spirituality. Our greatest scientist, Einstein, said, everything vibrates at an energetic signature. Everything is energy. She could feel, as we cultivated our friendship, the sincerity of my heart. 
And so that's when you talk about me thinking, you know, would she miss me? I I thought, hmm, would she? But but I know this bird because when I came back from Paris, that's when she, it was concrete, it was set in stone that there was something that this bird and I had between us that when I came home from Paris and she made it known to me without question, come and see what you missed. You know, yeah, you're you're a little late. Yeah, you didn't, you know, get to see when the baby was actually born like I wanted to. You know, you weren't in the operating room, quote unquote, but look what I have to show you because I know you're sincere. Mm-hmm. She felt my sincerity. So, yeah, I mean, you know, be authentic in in your desire to commune with the natural world around you and all those things that I talk about, like in the book and just my personal experiences post-book, after this experience with Artemis, was just fascinating the things that I would come across because Mm -hmm. it was like a whole new world that opened up to me when I asked it with a sincere heart to communicate with me. You know, and it leaves no doubt in my mind, too, uh, Noelle, is that this spills over into your work in probably some of the most fascinating ways as a graphic designer, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think... um, In other words, you're working from inspiration now instead of just trying to get people to be interested in your work. (laughs) And that's what draws them. (laughs) Well, and it's also like, you know, suddenly, you know, you get this trajectory. Now, I've always been a graphic designer. I mean, Mm -hmm. I went to college for that. So I'm... I like that creative flow, but now what, where the design has taken me is not so much designing for corporate and other people anymore and writing because, you know, I would write campaigns and slogans and marketing materials, but I never view, viewed myself as a writer. I never intended to write this book. It was just a personal journey and and I was writing in my journal to help myself heal from anxiety because I understood that that was part of, you know, part of a healing process is writing things down, is talking them out, whether it's into a tape recorder or with a therapist. And it just so happened that I was getting these great photographs because the times were so opportune. It was like this inspiration. I worked from home at the time, which was such a blessing because... When you know people go out to lunch to a restaurant, I'd go out to lunch to my balcony and spend it with a bird instead of a colleague. <laughs> so you know what I mean. So it was just one of those. Yeah, who where, wants to sit, you know, and have lunch with somebody who's going to complain about work? <laughs> exactly. And so I was just so blessed to have a camera, and each time the inspiration, you know, I'd be working at my computer, and something would say, "It's time to go outside. Time to just go and breathe and and be with." your friend, and sure enough, some photo would come from each experience that, as you see in the book, the succession of the way everything unfolded so perfectly. I just always happened to be there at the right time. And so it was just, it was just a great thing. And now I take my, my writing and my design and I apply it to all the things that I want to teach others through that you know, that life's work. Mm -hmm. You know, and what you also share, too, in your book is the idea that, you know, especially this day and age, there's so many people who are experiencing, you know, lack, for instance, and and there's just not enough, and and there's that worry and anxiety and fear that the next day may bring even less, but you can see through what you wrote, and of course, again, the marvelous photographs that you began to see there is more abundance around you than not only could you ever need, but probably ever even imagine. And it's a pretty encouraging thought each day that all of your needs will be met. Everything else is just a want. Oh, my gosh, that was huge. And you know what's interesting is as I, as I observed the back and forth from the nest out into foraging for nectar and sustainability for Artemis and then baby, you know, the, mm-hmm. her nestling. Um, this is what fascinated me about moving into learning more about the pollinators in general because they have the perfect balance of giving and receiving. 
and I watch that physically. And you hear people, inspirational speakers or, you know, uh, spiritual people that talk about being in balance, you know, having that balance so that you you never sort of lose your groundedness. Mm -hmm. And this was a tangible, visual thing that I could observe and say, hmm, nature, I am human nature. It's not a coincidence. I am to be in balance. And when that bird would go out and forage for her nectar, she only took what she needed each moment of each day, just what she needed at that moment to sustain her and her energy level and to feed her baby. And then when she needed more, she'd go out for more. And each time she got something for herself, i.e. the nectar, she would perpetuate new growth by having the pollen that was on her beak. And there were many photos in the book where you could see the yellow pollen on her beak Mm -hmm. that she would redistribute. So there was always that beautiful balance of giving and receiving, ebb and flow, and never taking more than she needed at the time she needed it. And that is one of the greatest lessons for the human being because the problem with us is when we call ourselves consumers, we think that's just a title that marketers, marketeers, and um, companies that provide a service or a product, they refer to the public as a consumer. But, but guess what? The word consumer, in my opinion, has a very negative connotation. It makes me feel that that's what we do. We just consume, consume. And we never stop to think, do I need this other half of the meal, or can I sustain with just this amount? Can I just take what I need right now to sustain myself and, t- and put less of a burden on all of the natural world around us that is trying to provide food for us? The pollinators. The burden of the pollinators to provide so much food is getting to be just that, burdensome. Mm-hmm. The burden of the the factory farms and the meat industry and all of that, the dairy industry, is just becoming that, a burden. We just keep consuming and consuming and consuming, and they have to keep dying and dying and dying. And there's respectful meat eaters and and, uh, food eaters out there, and that has to be us, Mm -hmm. the humans. We have to mirror what the natural world around us is doing, and that is, take what we need at the moment and know that we'll be provided for. We don't have to consume. And so I look at that as spiritual pollination, one of those things where we as humans can take on a little bit of the role of the pollinators, but in a spiritual a way that we look at our own heart and in our own quiet time say, I'm going to make a commitment to myself and to the natural world around me to eat less, and not because I want to look great in that bathing suit this summer, but because I want to I want to take a little bit of the burden off these beautiful creatures that are so in a position to feed me. You bring up something that I find real fascinating, and that is choice. And uh, I remember years ago I was talking with journalist Ann Powers on a book that she had produced. And uh, now here's a journalist out of New York that actually – makes a pretty good living and and uh she chooses to go to like thrift stores to buy her clothes Mm -hmm. and i was always kind of puzzled about that until i really started thinking about not only why she did that but what she was writing in her book as well and i began to have the reality you know that each of us want to see a change in the world that will move us let's say, away from things such as pollution and corporate greed and all these other things that we feel are wrong in our world. Yet, we sometimes look at the problem from an individual perspective that it's so big, why bother? Mm. And that she made that conscious decision because she wanted to take away people working in sweat factories, for instance, at a dollar a day or whatever it may be, that she made a decision, I will not participate in that, by buying brand new clothes. And I thought the wisdom in just something like that, people don't realize they're more empowered than they can ever imagine just by making a choice, just like what you're talking about here. Eat less, try to eat more organic, sustainable, on the farms, you know, buy local, so to speak. 
And I think that we're starting to wake up to that, maybe come out of the hypnotism that we've been lulled into over the last 50, 60, 70 years. And it's going to take some time, but as an individual, as one single person, just as you did, by showing and co-participating in the respect of nature, you found the return not only to be fascinating, but create such a ripple effect that you can go out and inspire others to do the same. I'd like to think so because I, I do understand what you're saying. And I do have people that say, <clears throat> what, what difference can I make? I'm one person against these huge corporations, these huge, huge industries, these, these legislators that are easily bought, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the thing is, is what we have to remember, and this is the law of the land of marketing and advertising, the consumer still has the power in that the supply and demand lies with the consumer. That will always be the rule that if there is a demand, there will be a supply. Once we decide that there is not a demand, there won't be a supply and there will be other creative ways that companies will provide services and products. Mm -hmm. So we have to just believe that it's like that critical mass that... Um, at, at some point, it will hit the critical mass each time you go into a restaurant and you know that you're going to a restaurant that serves gigantic portion. Either split the meal, and what I do is I just say, okay, with this you know, um, breakfast, how much uh, hash browns and how many eggs and um, how many pieces of bacon, for example, do, do you serve? And for the most part, the, the waitress or waiter will know, and I will say, okay, could you please cut that in half? I would only like X, Y, and Z. And I don't ask them, and can you, can you cut the cost in half? Because the first thing they want to say is, I'm sorry, I can't charge you less. And I say, please don't. What I would just like you to do is please ask the chef to only give me one egg and half the portion of the potatoes and you know, no toast, because I don't want to waste. I think mm -hmm. that is the cruelest thing we can do, is go in unconsciously, order off the menu, knowing full well what your, what your ability to eat is or what you want to eat if you make the choice to. I think I'm just going to go a little less this time mm -hmm. and order it anyway. And then they take your plate back, and the waste is so disrespectful to the, the world around us, the, the, the pollinators, the fruits, the vegetables, the animals. I think that is probably the worst thing we can do is waste. Mm -hmm. you know, Eating and I, too much is bad. But. Yeah, no, I agree with you. In fact, I years and years ago had worked in restaurants, and, and I've seen exactly what you're talking about. And I remember at the time I was beginning to, I guess, pursue my spiritual growth, which was through Eastern philosophy. And there was mm -hmm. one particular philosopher who's actually English-born, uh, Alan Watts, who was one of the primary people considered to introducing Zen to the West, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this marvelous essay that I've actually quoted on the show uh, off and on through the years, and it's called Murder in the Kitchen. And mm -hmm. the, the consensus in this thesis or this uh, essay that he writes is that we tend to uh, grow, prepare, and eat our food as though we hated it. <laughs> oh, my God. And he goes through talking about the manufacture of food. But what's fascinating about Alan Watts is when he shifts into that reflective, philosophical, heartfelt Zen side of himself, and he begins describing what the ultimate kitchen would look like. And it's one where you start finding yourself connected, as you talk about here uh, in your book, uh, The Hummingbird, is that you start having a reverent respect for what you're doing to where, you know, that you grow and you prepare and you cook your meal with a ritual of respect, you know, and that it supplies you even more than, than just energy. And it's interesting even like here in America versus, you know, other parts of the world, you know, the code for food, you know, the, the marketing code, if you will, for food in America is that it's fuel, <laughs> you know, whereas yeah. in France, the difference is you eat to enjoy eating. There's a big difference between those two experiences. 
Oh, yeah, and by the way, how do you feel when you go to your gas pump and you're paying $4.45 for a gallon <laughs> of gas? Do you feel love for that fuel? No. No, I don't. In fact, that's why I put it aside and started using tr- public transportation more often. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? That is at, that that what you just said about that author. I mean, that is incredible because it is so true. And if we think about, a lot of people don't know about. Um, have you heard of Dr. Emoto? The well, as a matter of fact, not only have I heard of him, but I've also met him. <laughs> oh, okay, so you know that you know right. he did the study of the molecular structure right. of water. It's the same thing with food. I I do regular blogs, and one of my blogs was through a photograph I took when I was driving through Colorado up into Telluride area, and there were these beautiful, just roaming, rolling hills of roaming cows. And so I got out of the car, and I took some photographs, and one of them, you know, I got a a beautiful close-up of this brown cow. And while he was open, or she, he, open in a grazing area, he still had a number that was tacked in his ear. So you know that eventually he was going to become, you know, part of the food chain. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he wasn't in a factory farm, which was really wonderful to see. And I remember writing a blog, and from his perspective, like actually he talking to the audience. And one of the things that I do every time I sit down to eat a meal is if I've had people say, Noel, I cannot become a vegetarian. My family, my, I have three teenage boys. They require protein in, in meat. And to that I say, that's, that's fine. Mm. I mean, no one ever said that, that there isn't, we can't have a food source in that chain. What we have to realize is you are eating the energy associated with that food. So the least we can do is when that food is finally brought to your table on a plate and you're getting ready to take your first bite, put your hands around the plate. Hold on to it just for a moment. Bow your head and in your own mind, in your own heart. Just say thank you. Just say thank you to the animal that gave its life force for this meal. And by the way, there's probably something else on the plate. And thank you for Mother Earth for sustaining me in this moment. Mm-hmm. There, it doesn't take anything. It doesn't take money to do that. It doesn't take any required, you know, paperwork to do that. It takes just the intention and the sincerity of the heart to say thank you to the food source. And then go ahead and eat your meat if you have to. But that, like I said, there is a way to be a respectful meat eater. And until this earth becomes a place where food, animals, living sentient beings no longer become a food source for the human being, that's going to be a change in consciousness that's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we will get there. But until we get there, can you at least show the source of food some honor? Mm -hmm. That's, That's all I say. So I believe what he says about, and Dr. Emoto proved that when he talked about the way the change of of the structure of the water when you take words that are loving and kind and in gratitude and when you put words that aren't. And guess what? Our bodies are made up of 70% water. The water that's in the food source, the plants, the fruits, the animals, it's all water and energy. So you're blessing the food that you're taking into your body, and that's a good thing for you. Mm-hmm. Now, although we didn't cover butterflies, we did so in a grand way because as anybody has ever heard of the butterfly effect, flap the butterfly's wings in New York and in China you get sunshine instead of rain. Well, in this case, for the book that is titled The Hummingbird That Answered My Heart's Call, Noel's butterfly has flapped its wings and instead of bitterness, you will have happiness and joy if you pick up this book. How can they find out how to get this? Um, well, you can order it through my website, which is www.benevolent.com. So that's B-E-E, as in honeybee, B-E-E hyphen nevolent, N-E-V-O-L-E-N-T dot com. Um, you can go onto the website. 10% of the proceeds go to the Pollinator um, Partnership, which is out of San Francisco. You can also order it on um, you know, your typical 
Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and um, and you can if you you know can't go right onto the website if you forget it, you can Google my name or Google the book, and you know you'll be directed to get it. So and there's other projects in the works, and also my website has a lot of my photography and the blogs, kind of like the animal symbolism and totems associated with the photographs and how we humans can relate to to these specific um, totems and. They're really fun because um, there's a lot of things that people don't know when, you know, a raven shows up in their life, what perhaps that raven is trying mm-hmm. to tell us, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And as Artemis would say, stay focused on the things that matter and the things that don't matter won't exist, right? Exactly. <laughs> Noel, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was really wonderful speaking with you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and go ahead and give out your website one more time for our listeners. Okay, it's benevolent, www.benevolent, B-E-N-E-V-O-L-E-N-T.com. Benevolent.com. Very good. Yep. Thank you again. Thank you. We'll also have, have a hot link out there for the listeners as well at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. You can find out more about the hummingbird that answered my heart's calling. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.